I'll come. Oops. All right. It's just saying that it's the recording is beginning. So um, I certainly got floored by that. <laughs> okay, so let me um, start again. So hello and welcome to this evening's event with Brent Libraries, Black British Novels, What Lies Beneath. My name is Sarah Smith and I am the Libraries Development Manager for Brent Libraries. This event forms part of the BBC novels that shaped our World Festival program in conjunction with Libraries Connected. It is designed to spread the word about great novels out there, introduce you to new authors and delve into the themes explored that I'm sure will resonate with us all. Very importantly, it is also about encouraging more people to explore and enjoy the pleasure of reading. Tonight, we are in the esteemed and enviable company of two award-winning authors. Alex Wheatle won the Guardian Young Adults Award for Crompton Nights and has written a series of young adult novels where young black protagonists, protagonists play the central roles. The Crompton Trilogy is one of Brent Library's most borrowed series. His most recent, Cane Warriors, is set in Jamaica and is based on the true story of an 18th century slave uprising. Alex's own story, based on his autobiography, or should I say semi-autobiography, Brixton Rocks, was adapted by Steve McQueen for his Small Axe series on BBC TV last autumn. You might recall Steve was the Oscar-winning director of 12 Years a Slave, so Alex is definitely moving in esteemed company. Derek Awuzo <laughs> is a new exciting author on the beat who won the Desmond Elliott 2020 award for his novel, That Reminds Me, a poignant and moving coming of age novel. He has edited the anthology Safe, 20 Ways to Be a Black Man in Britain Today, described by Benedine Evaristo as an outstanding myth-busting book everyone should read. Derek was the former co-host of literature podcast Mostly Lit and is an active podcaster and he's currently working on his next novel. We note that Derek's novel was the first novel by Stormzy's imprint but I doubt Derek will be sharing Stormzy's mobile or email address with us anytime soon. So join us on the virtual couch for an illuminating discussion as I pose questions to Alex and Derek and ask them about their writing journeys, the challenges faced, the stories they decided to tell and the passion they feel for their art, which we hope will encourage you to read their stories and others. Now, before I start, just one important housekeeping notice. This meeting is being recorded by Brent Council. The recording of this meeting is for the purpose of cultural information and for people who are unable to attend this live event. It will be stored on one of Brent's servers and will be accessible via Brent Library's Arts and Heritage YouTube channel. The YouTube video will be retained for a minimum of one year. It will be reviewed annually for continued retention and then deleted from YouTube once it is no longer required as an archive resource. The images of the attendees will not be visible on this recording, neither will the names of the attendees be visible. Full names will not be said out aloud in the recorded meeting. So now, I think we are ready to go. So, gentlemen, 
lovely to have you both here with us. And this is for the second time today, because in the afternoon, we did a session with two secondary schools. And can I say that um, both authors have waived their fees and said that they would like their fees to go towards supporting the libraries in both schools. So Brent Libraries will have the pleasure of putting together two collections of books featuring our wonderful authors and we'll throw in a few others as well. So can I say again, thank you so much gentlemen for your generosity and basically for investing in young people and their futures. Thank you for having us. Great. So Thank the you. first question that I'd like to um, ask is taking you back a bit to your school days. Some people say that school days are the best days of their lives. I wouldn't say it necessarily applies to everyone, but um, what I'd like to know, because you're both writers, did you feel then a passion for English? Did you enjoy that subject at school? Okay, who's going to step up first? Um, Alan? Yeah. I wouldn't say I enjoyed English, but I, I definitely enjoyed reading comics and storytelling in all shapes and forms. And so I remember as far back as when I was five or six, um, there used to be discarded comics lying on the dormitory floor of my children's home. And um, sometimes I had to patch them together with sellotape because the pages were torn. And um, those who are old enough might well remember uh, Wizard and Chips, the Beano Shoot magazine with Dandy. And um, it was great for me because it offered me a means of escape for my existence. And so sometimes I would uh, sneak downstairs and... Uh, on the back of the bikes, there used to be a reflector or uh, a little torch. And I used to take that and um, read the comics under the covers. And so that was my first introduction into reading. Uh, um, as far as school is concerned, I had a very difficult time because I don't think at that point in my life or in that era, that teachers were equipped to deal with somebody as traumatized as I was. And so I became disruptive because I didn't know how to express what I was feeling inside. But um, it was um, just reading for pleasure, really. And that's why I'm an advocate for reading for pleasure, because it can take you um, out of your everyday existence, if you like, the pain or misery that you, um, you are experiencing every day. So I think that's very important for younger listeners to understand that um, reading can offer that space, can offer that place where you can just be um, uh, out of your daily zone, if you like, and just enjoy, enjoy storytelling. Yes, I mean, I can see where reading can be such a comfort. And I think it's so true what you're saying that you can disappear to other worlds and shut out from reality. And I think that's it's so important for so many of us. What about you, Derek? Um, tell us about what it was like for you in school. Was there that passion there then? Or, um, you know, Alex references that, you know, family life for him was quite difficult. And so reading was a comfort. Tell us about you. Uh, I, I hated reading. Um, <laughs> I, hated, I hated school, I hated everything about it. But um, I, I did enjoy writing when I, was, when I was younger. You know, my earliest memory of writing was when I was in year four. Um, and I used to write stories told the story many, many times, but I used to write like really, really long stories, pages and pages of just uh, rambling adventures and things like that. And I used to have this strange habit that when I would write, my writing would become slanted. So by the time I'd finish the page, it'd be like just diagonal across the page like that. And um, I remember a teacher, I remember her name, I won't name it, but I remember her name, she came over and I was like, Miss, look, like I've written a story. I think it was like 10 pages, but just holding it in my hand, all the pages, it was amazing. I was like, I've written the story. And I mean, she just looked at it and she was like, yeah, your handwriting is terrible, Derek. And just threw the paper back onto the table. Um, and then I think the following day, or a couple of days after, we was all in assembly. All the, um, the whole, like year three up to year six, we were all kind of sitting on the floor with their legs crossed and, 
teachers in front. And then my, my full tutor, who was actually the head, deputy head of the school, came and said, everything that us as students need to do to improve ourselves. And she said, and a lot of you, you know, need to improve your handwriting. There's a particular young boy in my, hand, in my class whose handwriting is terrible. And he's an example. And everyone in, in the in the same way kind of just looked back at me and looked at me because well everyone in my class looked back at me because they knew what what happened. And I remember thinking, I remember thinking at a point, oh my god, I'm never gonna write again. And I still have that hang up now. I still will never let anybody look at my handwriting because I just feel like it's terrible. Um and it's, it is, I know it's 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 because of that. So no, I, I didn't enjoy reading or anything like that, you know, secondary school wasn't interested. Um, I remember we read of Mice and Men, but I never paid attention. I read of Mice and Men properly when I was 28. Um, and I had I took so much pleasure from reading it because I, I remember finished reading it and I just looked in and I thought, this is the book I was so intimidated by. And I just remember just threw it off. <laughs> I just threw it across the room or something like that. Um, but no, I, I started reading when I was 24. I really got into literature when I was 24, when I went to university and a university lecturer got me into it. You know, I was studying exercise science at the time and he just kind of challenged us all to, to read, read more literature because we would have to read research papers. And then that's when everything just kind of took off for me and I just discovered reading. And it was, it was just this amazing ex experience. It's, you know, if when I first started reading, I felt like I had a superpower. I, it really felt like that. I, it, was, it, was just, it was just incredible. Um, I started off with D.H. Lawrence and moved on to Oscar Wilde and Ian Forster. All, a lot of like the classics with kind of like just, you know, their initials and then their surname. I thought that's what writers were supposed to have. Like, you know what I mean? I should have had like D.O. and then my surname. <laughs> that's an <laughs> awful name. Um, but yeah, and yeah, so since I was 24, I think I've, I've read every single day up until now. If I don't read at least even like just 10 pages in a day, I just feel really uncomfortable. I feel really, I feel like I'm going to lose the gift of reading if I don't actually read. That's beautiful. That kind of sort of losing the gift if you don't stay in touch with reading. That's actually really quite a nice quote. Um, it's quite interesting when you're saying about the teacher and shaming you, because I think there's quite mm. a few of us that can recall teachers who didn't show that much empathy at all. And it does stay with you. Um, because I can remember being shamed about my weight. I remember the teacher looking at me and just saying, everybody in the class is a size 10 or a size 12, except for Sarah, who's a size 14. And um, it, stay, it stays with you. You know, you remember yeah. the teacher and you remember the remarks. So um, um, yeah, I am extremely sympathetic about that experience, which leads me on to sort of asking with both of you, because for myself, I was a struggling reader when I was at school, so a reluctant reader. I started with the Janet and John books and the Look Janet, Look, See John run, which I thought were the most boring books ever. Um, were you both, would you describe both yourselves as, um, you know, because some children really get into reading from a very early age, even though, as you say, you didn't really embrace reading until older, mm. but that ability to actually learn to read, because what I'm very conscious about um, in schools is those children who are failing because they haven't been able to learn to read for uh, you know various reasons. Mm. And it means then that if you don't learn in primary school, then I mean, the future for you by the time you get to secondary school is very questionable. So could I ask you both, when did you actually learn to start reading? With me, very early, um, obviously the comics. Um, I, I can't even remember what teacher taught me to read, but um, I just remember reading these comics at night. And uh, I guess the problem with me is that um, I found it very difficult to engage with the books that were given to me at primary level and secondary level. And the only book that I, I, wanted, to, I wanted to take home was An Inspector Calls. Um, what's the author's name? I think it's J.B. Priestley. Maybe someone yes. can help me out there. Was it yeah. Yeah. yeah, Priestley. Yeah. Um, and it engaged in me because uh, I could relate to the story of that poor girl who passed away in that narrative. 
And, uh, you know, I used to cry about that girl and, you know, how wicked the world was against her with this rich family. And, you know, that was the only text that I read in school that I thought, wow, you know, they're actually addressing an issue that I'm quite familiar with. And uh, I think that's the key. If we can introduce narratives that um, young children can relate to, you need to pique their interests. You cannot just give them uh, material that they're not um, engaged with. And so I think this is where the skill of the librarian comes into play, where they can identify what might be of interest to the students around them or the students that they serve. Once they do that, then you can definitely engage them in reading, even if they might be reluctant at first. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely agree. I think that for me, I didn't really, um, I, I remember I remember being taught how to read. Right? That, that's one of my earliest memories as well. But I don't remember ever being, inter ever being interested. I just really saw it as this kind of very schoolwork. It felt like homework having to read a book, you know. It just felt like, oh, I want to have fun. Why would I read a book? The book's not fun. Do you, you know what I mean? I just was uninterested. And I think it's because I just had this image of a reader in my mind um, as somebody who's just very boring. Um, so no, I was, I was, I just, I wasn't really interested actually. So I think that when, and it, it's, it's strange because when I really think back, I kind of feel like I taught myself to read in my twenties because for example, read, reading kind of like the classics and stuff like that. That's probably, I think that's probably why reading that was really difficult for me, even though I was really getting into it, it was really difficult. So I had like a little notebook, um, well, a big notebook, I still have it now actually, where any word I'll come across, I'll write it down, Google it, write down the meaning and keep referring back to it. And I'll just go through all of the words that I didn't understand. I would, I would do that in order to understand. But I also think there's a kind of just being able to read words on the page is just not the same as being able to comprehend a novel. Um, and I, 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 I realized that I would be reading the words sometimes and I just wouldn't really get what was, what was happening. I remember reading The Great Gatsby for the first time and um, there's a seat, well, it's not a spoiler because it's, I mean, the book's like hundred years old, but there's a right near the end when, um, when, when Gatsby is, um, is, is, is shot. I, I had to read that passage about five times because I was just, I just didn't understand the, I couldn't, understand the metaphors that Fitzgerald was using and the, the figurative language and the, you know, the impressionistic language that he was using, I couldn't grasp what was, what was happening. So when, I, yeah, so I think when so I say I taught myself to read, I taught myself to comprehend kind of like novelistic language and the way novels were, were structured. I, I couldn't, I definitely wouldn't have been able to, um, to, to, to do that before. And I think it's probably, yeah, because I wasn't paying attention in, in English, in, um, in primary school, in, in, in secondary school, I had, to, I had to teach myself how to do that. So really, for both of you, in different ways, that um, path to a passion for writing and reading, actually, is not the kind of ordinary, straightforward path at all. And mm -hmm. if I can follow through with that then, so um, school life wasn't easy, and um, one of the things that you both have in common is that you have been in care and um, that can affect you in terms of the stability of a family and a supportive family, because obviously you can be in a family and not in care, but that's not necessarily a supportive family at all. And I find sometimes it's quite interesting when you go into people's homes and the homes where you see books and the homes where you've got the big screen TV, but there is an absence of literature. And um, I think that can be so important in a child's upbringing. But I think for both of you, that hasn't been a straightforward path at all. So can you tell me a little bit about how that time of being in care has, mm. um, impacted on your journey? For me, the overwhelming emotion was loneliness. Uh, be, so, some people might be surprised at that because um, they say, oh, Alex, you suffered greatly, you know, you abused and all that. But really, um, now I'm in my 50s, it's still loneliness that is an overwhelming emotion. 
because um, I never received um, the normal kind of interactions I did uh, or that most people have with their parents. You know, the, a hug, good night, or you know, just a little kind of display of affection like that. And so um, I remember on Sundays, Sundays used to be visiting day. And um, I would see all the, um, the other children in our home get to meet their aunts, their uncles, sometimes their mothers and fathers. And, um, and so I used to have this uh, vivid imagination of where my family were. And I used to go to bed on those nights thinking um, and trying to imagine um, what my parents looked like, what they did, um, how they were, what kind of jobs they were doing. And so in a strange way, it kind of fired my imagination. You know, might imagine a, you know, and, and that indeed was some kind of protective shield for me, because even though I felt so alone, I did believe that there's someone out there for me. And I'd come back to this kind of um, feeling and emotion on every Sunday, you know, just believing that there was somebody out there. And that made me create little narratives in my mind just to keep me going through the week. You know, even though um, I never obviously received any of my family on any particular Sunday, but the idea of it, the fiction of it was um, kind of seeded in my head. And that's how I kind of got through those times. And so it's a double-edged sword because in a way it led to great trauma, but also a great imagination, a vivid imagination where I used to wonder and create my own kind of narratives in my mind um, centered around a possible family out there for me. And so when I came to actually write fiction, that experience of trying to imagine a life or a family life for me, that came into play with, um, especially my earlier books, um, Brenton Brown, he, um, he's a young mixed race boy trying to search for his family. Um, Seven Sisters, my, my third book, that's about um, a group of boys who um, I care experience trying to find their own way in the world. And so, People always talk about uh, my backdrops on the bricks and riots and whatever, but not really. My my great themes are really uh, family and my observations of that and um, how I perceive families and how they interact with each other and so on. And so in a strange way, my life without a family kind of informed my writing life. So essentially, family is at the centre and the heart, really, absolutely of, of what you do and yeah. um the thing is is if you've not had that experience of a loving family that stability that support i can quite imagine that your imagination can go into overdrive in terms of what you would like and it's great that you've been able to bring that out in your novels because how many of us do have perfect lives and it's about being able to see ourselves in novels. So yeah. leading on from that, Derek, what about yourself? Yeah, I, th I think my experience in care has allowed me to write about the search for identity in a unique way because it's been more pronounced because of where I've come from. Um, and it's, 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 it's still ongoing, you know. Um, I think that it's allowed me to put a lot of, like Alex put a lot of emphasis on family, family ties, mm -hmm. uh, friendship, connection, just, just general connection in, in, in what I write. That's, you know, that's always the underlining um, idea yeah. when, when I write, when I write in my fiction or when I'm writing poetry or, or when I'm writing mm -hmm. anything, it's always about just trying to connect with people. And I think that that's just come, comes from being in, you know, being in care, being taken away from your mother very young, and then being taken away from that mother again. You know, like 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 Alex, I, my imagination used to run, run wild. I used to mm -hmm. just, just I used to think when my my biological mom wasn't real, my real mom, but my biological dad wasn't my real dad, that there was another set out there somewhere who were gonna come and collect me again. I had um, that same that I had that same thought. I used to think that Dinah Ross and the Supremes would, you know, one day arrive at the children's home and say they're my mum or whatever and take me away. Yeah, 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 exactly. And it, it, that's, I think that's just something that 
that never goes away, you know, it never goes away because it, it happened once, it happened twice, maybe it could happen again. Um, and again, that, that informs, um, that informs a, lot of, a lot of what I write. Um, you know, I mean, and I'm not trying to, you know, say that you have to go through some sort of trauma in, able, in, in order to be able to, to write. I'm not trying to romanticize it or anything like that, but I just think that this, that's just the fact of the matter that that's informs my writing, whether people say it makes it the writing good or not, that's up to them. Well, I think we all have stories to tell, but I, um, I understand about, you know, the importance of relationships and families and also it, can affect you in terms of making new friends and relationships because it requires trust as well mm -hmm. and um, if you've been on your own and had to depend on yourself knowing mm -hmm. that there is no one else out there looking out for you um, it is a lonely path and um, it does make you reevaluate and you can be very careful in terms of the steps you take to go forward because it's also about protecting yourself as well. So mm -hmm. thank you for opening up about that. Um, in a few of the magazines and newspapers, they have a section aimed at authors and it's about a day in the life of a writer. So describe to us as authors, what is your average day like as an author? Do you take yourself off to the man shed? Do you kind of say to yourself, <laughs> right, I've got to write, you know, six hours and I'm not going to do anything until I've done those six hours. So because it's a discipline and um, in a different sort of way, it's quite a lonely job because you can't mm. be distracted. So um, tell me what a day in the life of a writer is like. <laughs> That's not very interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um, with me, I've, I've always been an early riser, even when I was a very young, young kid. And my days are trying to be um, another uh, reggae DJ or toaster, as we used to call him back in those days. I used to get up half five, six o'clock, little notebook, little notebook, pencil, and I, used to and I used to try to create lyrics for performance on a Friday or Saturday night. And uh, that was when I was 15, 16, 17. And I'm still the same. I still try to create in the morning. Um, and then uh, I now teach at university level. And so I have to prepare for those classes. I have to um, sometimes edit the work uh, or the next um, work in progress that I'm uh, contending with. And uh, I'm answering emails, I'm answering um, requests for school visits and, and so on. But usually um, I'm a morning person. So most of my work is done in the morning. Um, pre Pre-COVID, I would try to meet up with um, acquaintances, friends, and so on, maybe uh, late afternoon. But um, always morning for me. But as you, you know, every writer is different. Some writers like to um, produce those six hours of hard, hard slog. I, I can't do that. I've got to live a little. I've got to um, see life a little. You know, I've got to um, get out and walk to the park or somewhere. And I'm, I love open spaces. So um, sometimes I'll take my laptop to um, Clapham Common Bandstand. And I spend if it's a nice day, a couple of hours there and create. So depends. Oh well, yeah, my 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 routine is a lot more scattered than that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when I when when I wrote um, that reminds me, I I mean I started writing up. I was in a mental health facility when I first started writing that, um, and when I came out, the the last bits that I did and the editing, I just did it everywhere. I'll be on. The train and suddenly I think, wow, okay, I, I need to add this. Or I used to go to the South Bank, sit down there and write. I'll be walking and there'll be a bus stop. I'll sit down at the bus stop and, and write. Well, I'll see something that make me want to write about that in a, in, um, in a particular way. It's very difficult for me to have any kind of routine just because I would always have an idea in my head about maybe like the next chapter or the next verse or the next poem that I want to write. And it's weird. It feels like it's just stay, it's just stating the right word. Maybe maybe it's maybe it's just stating inside of me. And I it's 
I just know when it's ready. And if it's ready, it's like you're about to give birth, right? I gotta do it right now. I can't, you know, <laughs> I feel the desire to push, so I need to do it right now. I'm sorry. <laughs> do you know what I mean? No matter where I am, like I have to get it out right now. And that's that's what it feels like for me. I really wish I could have a routine where okay, you wake up in the morning, six o'clock, get, get a, you know, put a coffee on, go into the band cave, sit down, right? <laughs> Three hours get up, chill, do something else, come back to it. I, I, like, I really wish I could do that. I think, I, I, but I can't, I can't sit down and just produce, you know, I just have to have this, this, um, this artsy fartsy feeling, this kind of thing, that, <laughs> you know what I mean? Where I'm just like, okay, I've got to do it. Uh, right, let me go get a bottle of gin, some tonic, pour it, pour it, and then just, right, get out and then, and then done. And sometimes that's just three sentences. Or, you know, and I'm like, oh, I'm done. Or sometimes that's like 10 pages. And I'm like, okay, now I'm done. Do you know what I mean? I, I can never tell how long it's going to be. I just know the feeling or the idea or the impression that I'm trying to convey when it's done, it's done. You're both creatives. And it's just interesting the routes that you both choose to go in terms of um, creating. And I mean, that's quite interesting because I always find I enjoy reading that segment in a magazine or newspaper about the day in the life and um, kind of sort of being actually quite impressed when I see such a discipline. So it's good to hear from you both that it's not always as straightforward as that when it comes to being creative. Yeah, but also, Sarah, a lot of them are yeah. lying. They're lying. <laughs> <laughs> and also we don't say that on certain days you produce absolute tosh and it's got you got to bid it because you read it the next day you think oh my god did i write that it's awful you know, yeah the best yeah. the best writers in the world have very bad days i can and imagine so you go again yeah Yes. And um, yeah, you know, there are days when you must feel really frustrated and so on and just kind of sort of think, oh, you know, it's not coming. It's not coming. And um, I just kind of sort of think when, you know, publishers give advances and I sort of think, oh, my gosh, the pressure to actually have to produce because I've taken this money and I've probably spent it and I still don't feel <laughs> as if, you know, the creativity is coming out. It's true. But you know what the, the good thing about publishing at the moment? Um, definitely not the money, but the fact that they make sure that you've written at least, basically at least 90% of the novel before they would even take it. Um, I, I, for the majority of, of, of us, I've, I think people like Alice can literally just say, look, I've got this idea, give me the dosh, you know, and I'll, I'll produce it for you. <laughs> but when, when you're early in your career, like they won't take it unless you've got at least like maybe like 90% of it done. Mm. So that kind of pressure is, is, is off of you because you just have to write a little bit more and then, and then you're good to go. Yeah. Okay. All right, so one of the questions from the team here, um, which we thought was a really good question. Um, so often at some point in um, an author's writing career, many of them write an autobiography. And um, so the question, and I think Alex got a slight head start because we were running through the questions just before we came on air here. So, um, I'll start with Alex, so it gives you, Derek, a little bit more time to think about it. What would be the title of your autobiography? I guess it will be, um, and I'm, I'm always borrowing from Bob Marley, it'll probably be um, taking my stance again. Uh, it's, uh, it's a line from one of my favourite tracks, uh, The Heathen, on the Exodus album, and I think that would sum me up pretty well, taking my stance again, because... Um, uh, many times, you, be, you you know, life knocks us over, all of us, doesn't matter where you come from, what kind of background you have, it can kick you in the gut, you know, and sometimes you don't feel like getting up, sometimes you just want to um, draw the curtains, lie down somewhere and, and don't respond to anything. And, um, but it's how many times we get up, isn't it? And, uh, and face that life again, or face the world again. So um, yeah, I think taking my stance again would be a good title. Okay, so taking my stance again. All right, over to you, Derek. What do you think would be your title, which would be you? Uh, I'll probably call it That Reminds Me, to be honest. Um, 
No, I'm, uh, no, I'm, jo- I'm joking. I'm joking. Um, <laughs> um, I, I don't. I don't know. I think. I think it would probably be something to do with, with with belly buttons. I don't know why. I've always just kind of. I remember someone talking to me about um, talking about kids in um in 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 foster care. And for some reason, I just like, oh, do kids in foster care have belly buttons? And I just, I don't know why. This kind of really just kind of stuck with me. So I'm, I, I would, that would even be it or. Oh, goodness, I don't know. That's a that's a tough question to you know for someone on the spot. It takes a long time to think of titles for like books yeah. and short stories and stuff. So to be put on the spot like that, but um, I don't know. Maybe a quaba. Yeah, yeah, maybe a quaba, which is is tree for um, I get you welcome. You're welcome, and I guess it would kind of be me kind of talking about finally being welcomed into the folds of Ghanaian culture. Finding my identity, so Aquaba, I guess, yeah. Okay, so that would be your Ghanaian roots, and with Alex reflecting Bob Marley, taking my stance, right? So we can the cultural influences um, of our parents. Okay, nice one. So now both of you have been um, moving in illustrious company. So um, Alex. We know that um, your story, your coming of age story was retold in the small act series by Steve McQueen, the Oscar winning director of 12 Years a Slave. So um, we are seriously impressed. (laughs) (laughs) Well, um, um, I mean, such an accolade. Yeah, it is. It's overwhelming. It really was. And um, if uh, no one's aware, um, the Small Act series received 15 BAFTA nominations, which, you know, the whole team was so proud of that. Um, fantastic news. But um, before I met Steve, uh, a number of years ago, about 10, 12 years ago, uh, I did an event with 100 Black Men and they invited um, Tommy, Tommy Smith over from the US and Tommy okay. Smith, for those who don't know, mm-hmm. he won the 200 meter gold at the Mexico Olympic games. And he was the one who raised his fist with a black glove. Yeah. And um, he suffered from that terribly because the American authorities really made him pay. He lost any means of um, working. Um, they froze him out of work for 20 years afterwards. So he's a real hero of mine. And I remember um, I was a warm up act I was talking about my life and there's Tommy sitting in the audience and I just could not concentrate. I was stuttering. And when he finally um, stood up and clapped and he approached me and he said, very good story. Uh, I I was all tongue tied. My legs went to jelly. I just didn't know what to say. And, you know, uh, that's what happens when you meet one of your heroes. And, uh, you know, I I can only kind of calm down when I had a drink in my hand. I think it was probably a rum and coke. And I could relax and really get to know him. And what a moment. I mean, I'm, I'm very privileged to meet people like him. Uh, with Steve, um, from, the, from the very start, he was very driven. And that's what I noticed about people, people like him, achievers like him. They are very driven and they've got this incredible work ethic to get things done and get things on paper. And, and that's how he was. He had this vision that we had to realize for the, um, for the Small Act series. I mean, many of those episodes, he had in his mind already. I mean, for example, the mangrove, he came to the first morning with the, uh, the kind of story in his head already. And being in the writer's room, we just, we just fleshed it out a little. But, um, I can, you know, I really learned a great deal from being in that writer's room, being next to Steve McQueen, being on um, the set of Small Acts. I learned so, so much. In fact, it inspired me to see what I could accomplish maybe in a TV or film or short film or something like that, maybe in the future. But um, it was an incredible experience to me, overwhelming. And uh, to be next to a genius like that and see how his mind works was absolute privilege. And um, I'm just still overwhelmed. It's like um, when, I, when I go onto the BBC iPlayer, see my name on there, it's like, is that really me? I mean, there was a stage when I was visiting the set and they had made, um, they had created my hostel, the bedroom of my hostel, with all the flyers, the little record deck, the, um, the seven inch records and everything else, even a mattress, even the paintings that used to prop up my little bed. 
and it was so moving and overwhelming. I had to leave. Mm -hmm. I had to leave that space mm -hmm. because tears are coming down my face. It was yeah. it was so powerful. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, it makes me shudder sometimes when I realise that um, how many writers get their accolade of actually seeing their life stories portrayed on television. It's an enormous, incredible sensation. It really is. So I'll be proud to the end of my days. Oh, I, you know, wonderful. <laughs> Um, achievement and um, basically to work with as you say someone of such artistic strength but also you know um, wonderful for you but also I'm glad that you are thinking about wanting to kind of sort of move off into other directions and think about TV um, because it would be lovely to because your work then opens up to even a wider audience in terms of TV, writing for the theatre, because it's quite interesting when you meet some authors, some authors do straddle both. And I think one of the things with small acts, what I hope for, because um, we have seen some of it already, but to just see more of that where we see um, people of colour, being more visible and you know the opportunities to kind of expand so that we can see more of our stories on TV but that also that it shows us that when I say we're ordinary people we all have stories to tell and they're not all having to be sad stories they can be stories of joy absolutely well, yeah. a real mixture yes so yeah, absolutely um, there, there's no we, we discussed earlier today that there is no single black narrative and no. it doesn't yep. just have to be focused on black pain. And um, mm. we have to admit that it has been focused on black pain. Uh, a lot of it, a large chunk of, our, of the storytelling involving black people. And so I very much look forward to seeing now Steve's kicked down certain doors. Yeah. I very much hope to see an, expan an expansion of our narratives um, throughout all mediums, whether it's stage, whether it's um, television, film, you know, I want to see uh, stories of joy, stories of triumph, everything, sci-fi, mm. romantic comedy, why not, you know, because we engage with all those narratives, so it's something that um, I'm looking forward to see. Yes, so am I, so am I, absolutely, here, here. Derek Stormzy, now, um, last Christmas, well, not the Christmas that's just gone, but the previous Christmas when I was staying with my sister and, and her husband and kids, um, I was late to the party, but um, boys were, um, for whatever reason, they were playing Stormzy's Shut Up. And I have to say, here I was in my 50s and there was me and my younger sister and we were there dancing and really enjoying Shut Up. And then kind of being, you know, when anybody um, annoyed us, we'd sort of say, yes, yeah, Stormzy song, shut up. So um, anyway, tell us about Stormzy. You know what? <laughs> Everybody asked me this. And I mean, you know, I, I, I met him a, a, a couple of times. He's a very nice guy. He's a very... Um, He's very mandamish. So, you know, when I when I when I when I first met him, the first thing he said to me was, You're a sick guy, you're you're amazing. Like you he really gasses you up. And I'm thinking, okay, but you're stormsy, like what am I supposed to say to you? Like you, that you don't already know about yourself. Um but um, yeah, he's he's, he's 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 very he's, you know, he's very lovely. I think um before I even met him, I remember I just I woke up one morning, I think it was like seven o'clock in the morning, and I just checked my phone and someone was like, Oh, we should we should we should go for a drink, you know, let's meet up and go for a drink. And I was like, who the, who the hell is this? Do you know what I mean? And he was like, oh, by the way, it's Mike. And then he, he wrote in brackets underneath, uh, Stormzy. <laughs> and I just thought, to myself, at first I thought, how did you get my number? Um, but then I just, I just kind of thought, wow, like, you know, he's really just messaging me to say, oh, let's, let's meet up, let's go for a drink and kind of celebrate um, the book, which, 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 which was, yeah, it was, it was amazing. You know, the, the, the murky team have been really good to me, you know, if it wasn't for um, his manager, Aquia, that reminds me wouldn't have been published, you know, she kind of, she saw something in the, in, in the poetry and um, what I was trying to do, of course, she's, she's Ghanaian as well, so she got a lot of the Ghanaian references and was kind of like, I've never seen this on the page before in terms of the way that I was writing it, um, so I'm, yeah, I'm very grateful to that team. Yeah, I think, you know, another amazing journey. And, um, you know, 
I guess my idea of heaven would be Stormzy and Steve McQueen working together and um, Alex and you doing the script. I mean, that would be, <laughs> that would be perfect heaven for me. Perfect <laughs> heaven. And I'm holding, on, I'm holding on to that dream because I'm not saying it can't be possible. <laughs> okay, I notice that we're coming towards the end now. So I'm just gonna ask you two other questions and then I'm going to open it up to the audience because I'm sure that they will have questions that they'd like to ask you. So um, two things. Um, for, because one of the things about the BBC um, novels that shaped our world program. It's very much about wanting to encourage people of all ages to discover a love of reading. That is their, you know, a journey and a journey to give them pleasure, but not just that, as you've both said, it's been a comfort to you as well. It has influenced you in terms of your own writing. And also you have um, read widely in terms of um, the influences. And that's quite interesting to hear in terms of some of the authors that you have mentioned. So if you think about um, people out there who are listening to this, but also in terms of if they watch this recording, um, but, you know, for so many people, reading might not be the same passion that it is for some of us. What are the sorts of books that you would recommend to sort of say, OK, listen, you know, these are some lovely books and they're not difficult to get into. And, you know, we want you to join us on that reading journey. Mm. We're all different, so yeah. it really depends on your personal interests. Mm. Right? For example, if um, if I knew a young person who was um, um, had a skill set of athletics, for example, and um, they said to me, "Oh, Alex, I cannot get into reading," or and so forth, you know, there's nothing there for me. Immediately, I would take them to um, Jason Reynolds' uh, track series, mm. where all the um, protagonists. Are, um, athletes, young athletes, trying to trying to get ahead in that game, and so that's how I would cater um, books for um, reluctant readers. I would try to find out their interests first. I would try to become a librarian because um, any good librarian can administer that and say, "Okay, you're interested in this or interested in that," and so on. Like for instance, if there's a young lad at school who's interested in um, police shows or what, whatever it may be, and then I might introduce them to crime you know, crime books and so on. So I think we have to analyze and uh, consider the student or the young person involved and then, you know, use our minds to try and introduce them to something they can engage with and relate and most importantly, enjoy. Because that is what reading is all about. That's the, that's the first rule for me. You have to enjoy it because, you know, so many students sometimes tell me, you know, Alex, uh, I went through education. I had to study this book and study that book. And so I just kind of got put off reading. But I think if we can somehow, you know, from primary school where they're, where they're taught to uh, enjoy a narrative, but we can carry that through secondary education as well. I know some schools uh, in South London, they have initiated this um, idea that um, drop everything and read moments. So the mm. students are obliged to go to the library, pick out something that they enjoy, that they don't have to study, they can just enjoy. And it doesn't have to be a, a classic, it can be a graphic novel or anything else. And I think that is great because that would keep them on track for um, want to discover um, other narratives that they might enjoy. And so, I think that is a way to keep them engaged in reading because I've got so much pleasure from it. I know Derek has, and it got, it's got so much to offer, I believe. And uh, because storytelling is in our DNA. I remember my father telling me before he passed that uh, when he was a young child in Jamaica growing up, that um, at, at harvest time, when the fish was roasted and everyone um, gathered around a fire, um, he said that the local storyteller, he, that would be his time. And uh, he would tell interpretations of the Bible or any other kind of stories or Nancy tales or whatever it may be. And that was his 
that was like his duty, his role. Mm -hmm. And it was a, um, it was an esteemed role as well. You know, and I'm talking, um, I'm talking over 85, 85 years ago in Jamaica in a little hamlet. And so storytelling is really in our DNA. We just need to relate with it and engage with it and find something that can move us and touch us. Here, here. Yes. Oh, really. uh, and Derek, um, yeah, I, posing that question, but bringing in your podcast because you're a podcaster as yeah. well. So the way that you also harness literature through your podcasting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, when I when I used to do you know the most elite podcast, one thing we would always talk about was how can we make this accessible? How can we speak about it in a language that people will engage with? And I've I've now found that as well in writing that's important. So I mean, when my goal for the last four years is to, you know my kind of mantra has been how do I get the man them reading? How do I get you know young black boys to engage with literature? And I think it's about really tapping into what it is that they're, you know, into. And to generalize, you know, a lot, you know, I work in publishing and, you know, you hear whispers that, you know, young black men don't read, young black boys don't read. This is this is kind of the whisper that, that goes wrong. And the thing is that they, they, they do read, right? But they just read spe like specific kinds of books, you know? So when I was, when I was, you know, in my early twenties, Everybody where I was from, you know, in, in North London and Tottenham, they were reading really self-help books, you know. I don't know a young black man who hasn't read or heard of Rich Dad, Poor Dad or the 48 Laws of Power, you know, or those, those kind of books. So I think a gateway into that, if you want to get into read fiction, is something like, like The Alchemist. Give them The Alchemist, like, yo, look, this is, it will help you, you know, because a lot of these young, young boys, their whole mentality is, I want to better myself. How can I make money? How can I do this? How can I get out of this kind of working class situation that I'm in? If you present them with a book and say, look, if you read this book, it gives you the tips to do this, this, that, and the other, you know, follow your dreams and all that kind of thing. I feel like the alchemist is the gateway drug in order to get them to start reading fiction, but you're also giving them that thing that they want um, as well. I think that, that that's really important. And again, as Alex said, it's about, stories that they they can relate to. I, I think it really kind of hit home to me when I, I went to a um I went to a private school and I did a reading from from that reminds me and I, I read one of the verses and I remember after I finished I think five of <laughs> five of the the young black girls came up to me and they said did you really talk about Dax for your hair in, in your book? And I was like well, yeah, of course I'd be talking about Dax. <laughs> you know what I mean? And they were just like, oh, really? oh well, I really want to read that now. Like, I want to see what you're saying about these, these hair care products, you know? And so it's, it's about really just putting those kind of elements into the books so they can, it excites them. Like, if, you know, it's kind of like, for example, if you watch, if you're watching, if you're watching a music video or if you're watching a movie and suddenly your house appears on the screen, you're like, oh, that's my house. Like, my house, which, do you know what I mean? Like, mm. <laughs> just, 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 the camera just passed my, that kind of excitement, I feel like is important to get, especially young people into literature, things that they can relate to and recognize and be like, oh my God, I can't believe it. Do you know what I mean? That's wonderful. It's great to have both your takes on encouraging young people. And you know what? It's just so lovely to have both you here as male authors. And I mean, you know, your role models as well. But I mean, you're sharing life, real life. And um, I think that's just so important. Thank it's you. been an absolute pleasure talking to you. And, um, you know, I don't feel I can hog the limelight anymore with you two. I feel um, I need to um, allow our audience here tonight to ask a few questions before we close. So um, Fiona, who's one of the team, um, Fiona, You've been keeping an eye on the I have. Um, questions. I so, have. Uh, can I just say, Alex Pascal, I know you're in the audience. Hold your horses. We will go over to you at some point and you can ask your question um, because poor Alex has just had some technical problems tonight. So uh, we really would like to hear him. So first question is from Charlotte. What were the top two iconic books that you read during the C19 pandemic that you are willing to recommend to others and why? Let's go to Derek first. Hmm. Um, I mean, I, I wasn't able to read a lot 
during the pandemic, um, if I'm honest. Um, um, but one of the books I did read was an amazing book called The Street um, by an author called B. Bandele. I believe he's, a, I think he's a film director now or a screenwriter. Um, I read that, that was, that was very interesting. Um, it was, I think what it did for me was allow me to see kind of the kind of, the ideas, I felt, I felt like I could see kind of like his working pages, what he just said to himself, this is what I'm going to put in and then I'm going to put this in there and all that kind of thing. I was able to kind of see that in the way um, he structured the novel and the things that he was talking about. So that was, that was really good. But then I also read this amazing book, actually, um, it's, called, it's called When We Cease to Understand the World by I believe his name is Benjamin Lovatut, I think. And it's um it's this it's really interesting thing that's happening in fiction at the moment where people are writing, I guess, 100% fact. So they 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 they're called they're called nonfiction novels. Um and it's it's majority of it is all facts, but there is this it's, it's, it's more narrative, so it's more it's they're calling it novels. And I just find it really fascinating. And that's that was one of the books. Um, there's a lot of books on the International Booker Prize that I like that where it's kind of, you know, 100% fact, but they're, it's, it's, they're marketed as, as novels. But that was one of them, yeah, when we cease to understand the world, it, it made it very, very clever, very, very clever book, really interesting. So um, I would say those two books for me. Thank you, Derek. Alex, what about you? Um, yeah, I've really been impressed by um, Daniel Jawando's debut novel, uh, When the Stars Are Burning Brightly. I know, um, I know Sarah is a big fan of that, of that book, and she's uh, um, she's a young, a young, a young lady entering the YA fiction scene, and she's going to be a big star. And the story is about this um, this young guy who um, tries to find out why. His uh, uh, brother uh, committed suicide. It might sound bleak, but um, also it's set in Wimshaw um, near Manchester, and it's very rare that we get a novel uh, with those with that subject matter set in the north of the country. And um, I celebrate that because I I work in Manchester and I know the talent that's um, emerging from the north, and sometimes that that talent gets neglected because um, fiction can be uh, London centric. So, um, you know, I, I championed that. And, and also, Benjamin Zephaniah, he came out with a novel last year called Windrush Child. And uh, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if uh, Sarah has that under her table, but um, I can really engage <laughs> and relate with that, with that story because um, that tells a story of um, two or three of my cousins. They had exactly that same experience coming from the Caribbean, trying to settle here, not quite feeling accepted and so on. And so those are the two I recommend uh, for uh, younger reasons. But I just started to read um, Nadifa Mohammed's The Fortune Men. Oh, I need that. I'm I need that this. book in my life, man. I need it. I'm loving this. Um, and uh, I've been a big fan of Nadifa Mohammed over the years. I think she's very underrated. And mm -hmm. this is a story of, um, because there was a Somalian community that lived in Southern Wales many, many years ago. What well, is still there, uh, some of them. And um, yeah, I definitely recommend this, even though I've only read about 30 pages or so. So that's, that is The Fortune Men by Nadifa Mohammed, very underrated. She's an incredible author. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. OK, so a question from Alison. What was the reaction of your first publisher to your book? So presumably the first book you presented to them, they read it and they said, what did they say? Derek? That would be easier for you to remember, actually, Derek. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> no offence, Alex. <laughs> to, 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 to be fair, when, when, when my publisher first got hold of the manuscript, um, he was just kind of like, well, this is, well, I mean, he was like, well, this is, this is, this is nice. What else have you got? <laughs> um, <laughs> do you know what I mean? And so it, it wasn't going to be published first, but as I, as I said, you know, Stormzy's manager at Queer was very adamant that that's what they wanted to publish um and then and then eventually it was kind of like okay yes we can work we can work with this you know what i mean um but i think i think I've, I've been very very lucky you know i've been i've had the benefit of people who have come before me or very supportive uh contemporary writers who have 
put me on, you know, I, I got an agent because of a writer who literally emailed their agent and said, you should take on Derek. Again, you know, and my first book deal again was because someone put me on with, um, that reminds me that's again, because, you know, I was put on by somebody and said, you should meet Stormzy's manager. Do you know what I mean? Um, I feel like I've been, I've been very, very, very lucky. So, you know, of, of course, I know that the, those 60 rejections are, are going to come, you know, I mean, a lot of them have come actually, you know, going out on submission with my, my second book, you know, you'd think that, and it probably very naive of me to think that, okay, because I've, I've put our book, it's done okay. You know, I've, I've, I've won a major award. It should be easy to get my second book published. Absolutely not. <laughs> Absolutely not. It was, it was, it was still, it was still difficult. Right. And you, Alex? Uh, funny enough, um, on the uh, on the guest week day, we have um, Geraldine Cook, who used to be yeah. commissioning editor at Headline, I understand. And uh, I submitted um, Britain Rock to her. She couldn't quite um, publish it. Um, maybe she can tell us the reasons why I'm putting her on the spot now. But um, she, uh, along with uh, Joan Deitch, one of her colleagues at the time at Headline, they sent me very encouraging letters to persevere with Bricks and Rock. I mean, um, it was very raw and rough that, and it needed a bit of work on the grammar and everything else. But it was finally published by Black Hammer Books, a very small press um, by, uh, run by Rosemary Hudson. And this was uh, 1999. And uh, I remember when I received a call from her, I thought it was somebody winding me up because I had about um, 30 rejections from literary agents and publishers as well. And, uh, but I persevered and um, Rosemary took it on. And um, I remember she was an incredible woman because she managed to get uh, advertising on a 109 bus going down Brixton Hill. You cannot imagine a feeling that I had mm. when I saw that bus <laughs> down Brixton Hill with Brixton Rock on its side. I mean, that, that has got to be my number one moment in being published. It, it, it's still, I, I still can't be that to see that bus and pointing out to a friend of mine, hey, that's me <laughs> on that bus, or one of my bus, because um, I used to live on Brixton Hill and I used to walk down there and go to the record shop and so on. So to actually see my book advertised on a 109 bus, not even at MBE you can be that. Fantastic, absolutely fantastic. That's so good. Yeah, we, we do love our Geraldine, Geraldine Cook. She actually runs one of our local volunteer libraries in Brent. Um, so she's never very far from her book. And she has put a, co a comment down saying, uh, yeah, Alex, that's so true about the wonderful way libraries, librarians can in inspire people. So uh, we do love our Geraldine. So um, now we've got Molly, what advice would you give to young writers in terms of getting published? What paths did you take? And if you had to deal with rejection, how did you cope? Oh, um, firstly, I would suggest that you find a subject matter that you feel passionate about, you know, something that you want to tell the world, something that is um, stirring in your stomach and in your chest and you want to bring forth and and um, you know, express that kind of, uh, whether it's an outrage, whether it's an injustice, whether it's an emotion, just find something that you feel passionate about. That would be my first one. Um, my second uh, tip would be to try to get your uh, work or your work in progress in front of um, as many professional eyes as you can. Um, the family might be nice, it might be pleasant. So, oh, that's great that you found a hobby and so on. <laughs> but um, this is where the this is where the Geraldine Cooks can really come into play here and give you um, good professional advice. Obviously, editors are very very busy, but um, just try and find somebody who can give a professional eye over your work, so they could uh, advise advise you on structure and um, content and grammar and everything else. Fantastic. Now, have you coped with any rejection, Alex? Or has that not rejection, happened to you? I, I was, oh yes, I was quite bullheaded. Um, I, used, I used to say to myself, what are you talking about? My, my novel's fantastic. And so I think that helped me. 
that actually helped me because I felt that they were talking rubbish and um, Bricks and Rock was the best novel since, I don't know, uh, Ulysses or whatever, you know, <laughs> or The Count of Monte Cristo or, or anything else that's gone on before. I just believed, and I think uh, that is half the battle, you have to believe that what you're producing, that what you're creating mm. is worthy and valuable. Mm -hmm. And the characters in that story are the same, worthy and valuable. I just believed that. And even though I had to do a lot of work on it, um, that was my essential belief that this is a worthwhile cause that I'm trying to pursue. Fantastic. Derek, how about you? I, I would say in terms of like the writing process, have fun. You know, just, just have fun. Don't, don't, don't write to try and sell 100,000 books because it's very unlikely. If you're writing fiction, I believe the average novel sells about 600 copies in its lifetime. Um, so just, just have fun with it. If you enjoy writing, just, just do it, you know, do it and, and, and have fun with it and whatever happens, happens, you know. And yeah, definitely be prepared for the rejections from, from editors, from, from agents, because, and it's, it's never, it's never, oh, I don't like this person. Do you know what I mean? It's just kind of like this particular story doesn't resonate with me because editors and agents will tell you that they accept books based on their taste. So for example, a classic, like uh, a, what I deem a classic, like The Great Gatsby could get submitted to an agent now and they'll be like, this, this is just not for me. In my mind, that's crazy, but it just comes down to people's taste. Do you know what I mean? So you should, you should, you should never take it that, oh my God, they just don't like me, I'm, I'm a terrible writer, no. I mean, I say this, but I'm very, very bad at dealing with rejection. If I didn't have my agent, uh, Crystal Mahay Morgan, I don't know if I would have coped with this second book because, you know, and and bless her, she really tried to shield me, but I would be like, what did they say? Tell me what, what did this, I need to see what they said. She really tried to shield me. Um, but she was, she was, and she was like, Derek, the book will get published. Just relax, don't worry. This doesn't mean you're a terrible writer, but in my mind, you know, one reject, and even a nice rejection, where it would be like, they would say lovely things. And then at the end, they'll say, it but, unfo <laughs> but, un but unfortunately it's not for us. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> they yeah, say lovely things, you know? And then you just think, oh, damn, man. And then you just think, you know what? Maybe, maybe this isn't for me. You know, maybe, maybe I should, maybe I should just go back and, you know, go back to the gym, start working in the gym. Yeah, like this, the force that uh, go, go through your head. But then when someone does say, Yes, I'm gonna take this to acquisition. Then you're like, I knew I was the greatest writer of all time. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah, just just and I guess anticipate that moment of yes. Do you know what I mean? Anticipate that moment, but also just be prepared for a lot of the kind of you know the re the rejection that's just going to come. No, no matter where you are in in in, in your career, yeah. you know you, you're going to get rejected by some publishers because it's a taste mm. thing. Yeah. Yeah, I get that. Okay, so Jackie, clearly a woman after our own hearts, that's Sarah, Kate, Gerata and myself. Uh, what are your thoughts about the role libraries play in society? Let's go to Derek first. You know, I can't answer, really answer this question just because I didn't really have much of a relationship with, with libraries outside of universities. My university library, you know, when I was in Bolton was that was my sanctuary. I was there all the time, you know, and um, there was a, a great, a great selection of, of books and all of those kind of things. But so, yeah, I guess, no, yeah, it, it, it can serve as kind of like a sanctuary. You do feel safe there yeah. when you're sitting and, and, and you're reading, you, you know, you, you're in a bubble and you just feel like you're just surrounded by, by like-minded people. Do you know what I mean? Even though you won't get up and try and have a conversation with them, but you could just look over to someone reading and instantly there's just that this just bond that develops between the two of you because you, you feel like, oh, you're both in you wonder what they it's kind of like when you see somebody reading on the train and you're just kind of you're looking to see what book they're reading and you hope that they notice that you're looking at yes. the book that they're reading. <laughs> so then they go, oh yeah, you, you can be like a little nod, yeah, do you know what I mean? Um that kind of that feeling of connection, yeah, develops in in, in libraries. And I think that's that's what you need in, in society, really. Do you know what I mean? I'm always looking on the train to see if they've got the dust cover on it with the plastic on it so that I know it's a library book. That's what <laughs> I would say on the train. Alex, what about you? What, what role do you think we play? 
Oh, fantastic. Libraries are a great leveler. I mean, um, when I emerged from prison, I, I could not afford to go to the bookshop and buy the books that I wanted to buy. So I had to access them in my local library. And that was a Brixton library adjacent to um, Windrush Square in middle Brixton. And that, um, that made me continue my education, if you like. So um, crucial, especially in um, schools. Um, I understand that it's not compulsory to have a library in a school, even though it's compulsory to have a library in a prison, which is absurd. I mean, how can that be? So libraries are special places to me. It's where I did a lot of my learning and education. Fantastic, yep. And clearly you two do value our school libraries because of the gesture you've made today, which is just wonderful. Uh, now from Fatima, how do you find the space of finding your voice when writing after an intense reading binge and a break from writing or just finding your voice generally? Um, what, what, what does she mean by finding your voice? Um, I think what she means is if you've had a break from writing, so you've just yeah. been reading, 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 reading like mad, right. okay. how do you keep your headspace back into writing? Um, I, I like to enjoy other art forms, whether it's um, theatre, whether it's film, whether it's anything else or sport even. Um, and sometimes I need that break, um, you know, because you might have come off um, an intense editing period of uh, two, three weeks or so. So you need to give your brain a bit of a rest. And um, slowly but surely, um, ideas will start forming my mind or and I'll start to marinate those ideas. But I do not hit the, um, the laptop immediately. I let them form, I let them seed. And then uh, there's a there's a story kind of idea, you know, and that's when I attack it, not at the first seed, but maybe when there's about uh, a sapling of a tree or something in somewhere in, somewhere in my head, that is when I start a new story. Uh, but mm. everyone's different. Everyone's different. Some some writers I know, they don't have to have a seed. They just they just type that first page at, at their first sitting. I, I cannot do that. Yeah, I can't. I can't. I can't do that okay um yeah so anything to add to that derek oh sorry yeah i'm just talking to myself <laughs> um uh yeah no i i would say i would say that it it comes down to confidence i think that you need to be able to section yourself off as a writer to like from from other writers do you know what i mean so for example back when i was first reading and i would read go you know read a lot and then I'll start writing I noticed that I was taking on the style of the the the, the writer I just read now when I read a, a great writer I think how can Derek write something better than that and I feel like it's just finding yourself as a writer having the confidence to say that okay I'm in the same room with these people I don't need to merge into them I don't need to become them I could just be myself and and write that. I, and I also think it's important just to trust the voice in your head as well. Not try and put on, you know, I guess not see writing as you sitting in an interview. And, and this goes for non, non-fiction mainly. Not see it as I'm sitting in an interview. I need to put on, like, you know how mothers do when somebody calls you put on the posh voice. Like, you don't need to do that with writing. Just write in the voice that is in your head. Just yeah. put it onto the page. And I think that that's the best thing so that when you then start to write fiction and you imagine a character, your voice will be within the same authenticity as your own, your own voice. Do you know if, if that makes sense? Yes. Makes sense in my head. But um, yeah, I think, I think that's what it's, that, that's what it, I think what a lot of people, what a lot of people do, and I did myself, you know, when you're writing, when you're a beginner, you put on airs, you think that you need to, Right in this particular kind of, of voice, you know, and I think it's probably because when we when we read, I remember seeing a study about seven years ago was that we read in a posher voice than we actually speak, you know. When we read, we no, we read novels, and I don't know where that comes from, but we we do that, and I think maybe sometimes that transfers into when we begin to write as well. We don't trust our own voice. The way I'm talking now, someone might think I can't I can't write like that. That's not the acceptable way to. Who, who tells you? Of course, it is fine. <laughs> you know, write the way. If this is how you're going to write, write like this, and then develop it afterwards and change the styles and whatever like that. But you need the the the, the basis of authenticity first. That's fascinating. Yeah, um, 
Derek is absolutely right. Um, in, in the very first drafts of Bricks and Rock, I was trying to write like James Joyce, you know, which is which is absolutely ridiculous. You know, I had to try and find my own voice, my own natural voice to um, get to the point where it was publishable. And um, I guess with Eastway Clane, I just really adopted my my own kind of Brixtonian voice, if you like. Mm. And uh, that was much more successful than me trying to imitate somebody else. Yeah, I'm, I'm really conscious of the time here. I'm just going to bring Alex. Alex, can you ask your question, please? Because we, we've missed you this evening. I know Sarah is going to beat me up. I know that. But <laughs> no, I, have to admit, I have to admit that technology and I don't seem to work very well there is just something about it well let me say this guys Sarah you pulled out something from these two brothers that is really library books writing I'm a wordsmith but I'm a communicator by voice a very different person but I understand everything that you have said but it's true when I look and listen to the two of you I realize I'm from a distant age and your opportunities today and the stream of where you can go is not where I, I, I still not there. Because if I go back to my school days, we had a thing that we used to say when people write ABC Sprat, catch a rat, when you're tired, let it go. That means you say it and somebody copy it and it goes on and it passed down because we didn't have newspapers of that in, in the period. The Calypsonians really were the people who informed me. In the village we had people, whether they were drummers, storytellers, whatever they were, they were conversational people, right? And we really enjoyed that in the moonlight or wherever we went. You're living in a total different era to what I have come from. What I did a lot of in my radio life is to interview writers and to encourage people to speak because I was trained as an orator. As a, I came out of grammar school actually as an orator, I became a drummer and I used the old stories of the people that I knew to tell my and their own stories. So it's mm. fascinating. I mean, Sarah, when I used to come to, to Brent Library and the schools and we went around, it was quite a different pe period to where we are right now. And so, so you fellas, I mean, I take it out to you. I mean, there it is. You you have somebody that you're right in line with, Derek Stomzy. I haven't met this guy yet, but I think we could, boy, we could break down some good barriers together. Um, Alex, the time we spent in uh, um, Clapham, what do you call it, the library? Yeah. All right. We well, it was more the elder people telling the stories of when they came, the historical side to so many things that we, the elders, still want to tell the way we want to tell it. But you're gone now to say, I am going to tell my story in Britain, the way I'm living. Yeah. And you have somebody in the library who could say to you, well, I'm taking this on. We didn't have that. So you have a lot of more chances. I don't know how we managed to break those doors down to let you in. Mm. But you have broken the door down. Like, like when Obama yeah. was coming in, everybody was saying, oh, he's going to, and I said to them, watch it. He's only cracking the glass. We got to break it up now. Yeah. Um, and they were, you know, Alex, they were looking at Obama as he was able to do everything and I knew he couldn't because he was so rounded. And so thanks to you fellows for breaking the, smashing up the ice, but we must not sit back to believe that everything is okay because every 10 years in this country, mm. something changes. Mm. I have, well, measured, I've, I've measured it. 
So Alex, um, <laughs> I used to listen to your tones on Radio London mm -hmm. and you used to um, relate stories from our community. Mm -hmm. And so there's no way I could have been a storyteller if there wasn't others like yourself telling stories or relating stories uh, before me. And, um, and this is why it's so important that we honour those ones who have um, come before us. And I, I'm certainly like that because um, in my storytelling experience, uh, I learned that from the dance hall or um, parties or dances where uh, young men would um, hold the microphone. And when they hold the microphone, a skilled toaster, as we used to refer to them in those days, they would tell different stories of that community whatever it may be what it could have been a, a story about um a rasta getting kicked out of his home by his um christian mother you know all kinds of different stories that uh, flooded my brain flooded my um experiences if you like and so really i'm no different to um those um old time toasters back in the mid 1970s early 1980s and there used to be this guy in brixton market called bionic and Barnick, he would sell cassette tapes of um, sound system dances in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. And I used to listen to the likes of Brigadier Jerry, the Lone Ranger and Yellow Man, people like that. And despite my father, he would listen to clips and music and be inspired by those stories. Mm -hmm. And so they pass it on. And Bob Marley wrote a famous song called Pass It On. And um, I believe that um, that storytelling kind of vibe has been passed on to me by the people who I used to listen to, the people that I used to admire, and so on. I mean, I could go back to blues and Betty Smith and Robert Johnson and all those kind of people who told stories in their music. I'm not any different from those people, even though I might choose a different form. And so this is why I honor those who have come before me. I remember there was this uh, collection of women's fiction sent in Brixton that was published in the early 1980s. I mean, that was a fantastic um, thing for me to read and understand and um, admire. And so really, I'm just replicating what they did. Um, I'm also replicating what Sam Sevlon tried to do and so on. And uh, well, who's the other one that you mentioned earlier, Alex? Um, was it Lemming? George Lamming. George Lamming, absolutely. So I'm only taking their baton and trying to um and trying to spin my own experiences. And um, you know, now uh, there's the likes of Derek following me. So the baton is his now, and he's going to inspire people who are younger than he is. And for me, that is how it works. Mm. Okay. Derek. I mean, I hope so, Alex. <laughs> 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 when when I was asked to write for the Teletubbies, I, I said to them, I write it, but we'll perform it. Because I saw performance being so much stronger, and I saw placing music and dance, you get other children, it's like leaves, they begin to open in strange ways that others never expect, uh, would have expected. I, there was a time I went to, to Wales and I was in a car and we were driving to go to do a workshop. And the thing just came to me, fires burning, fires burning, draw nearer, draw nearer to the fire, to the fire. And that sparked off from an old song we used to sing in the Caribbean. And it brought to me the burning of the sugarcane fields and the coal mining. And that's how I wrote, I think, the book that you will find common threads holds so many threads of things and people that I wanted to write with Shango, a lot of things that does with the culture of Africa, with the culture of the Caribbean. Sarah, I have a feeling that we need to do a days of the oldies guys like me, ladies like me, and uh, then get these two other brothers to judge where we are. I think that's a um, wonderful um, idea for yeah. an event going forward. And I think um, that's quite a nice way of um, bringing this evening to a close. It's been an absolute delight. Has um, Derek just disappeared? No, oh, he's there, he's yeah. at the top. Okay. Is that the top? Yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah, I thought you'd gone for a moment. No, just 
um, it's been an absolute delight. Um, so, you know, on behalf of Brent Libraries and um, the wonderful audience here tonight, um, we'd like to thank you for such an illuminating, enlightening and um, honest evening where you have opened up your hearts and shared with us. And um, I'd like to see more of this going forward. And um, it is just wonderful to have you both here in our company. And um, we wish you the best going forward. Thank you. And um, Thank you. we look forward to having you back again. And Alex, yep. get, really to grip, get to grips with that, um, the technical stuff so that you can be with us as well. I have so, this too. Um, we, the you know, we missed you. People would help me. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the, um, to the audience, please don't forget to complete the um, evaluation. And um, thank you so much for taking time out to join us this evening. Um, it's been absolutely delightful. And thank you very much again to my esteemed guests. Thank, thank you. you.